In this video, we'll talk about GPCR coupled receptor signaling and the subtypes of GPCR signaling. So this is included in the cell communication and signaling playlist. Definitely watch that playlist for all high quality content. Stay tuned till the end. This is a slightly longish video, but if you stay tuned till the end, it would be totally clear to you. We would talk about what is GPCR signaling, why it is important in physiological context. Then we talk about the classification of G protein coupled receptor signaling. And lastly, we'll talk about the regulation of G protein coupled receptor signaling. So all of these concepts are based on fundamental textbooks. So this would give you a total textbook like feeling. What are G proteins? They are molecular switches that can transmit cellular signal and they are regulated by GTP and GDP. So they have switching uh, capabilities. That means they have an on and an off mode. And this on and off mode is dependent on whether they are bound to GDP or GTP. Now G proteins can be monomeric, can be multimeric. There are trimeric G proteins as well. Monomeric G proteins are associated with processes like vesicular trafficking, cell locomotion, etc. Trimeric G proteins are associated with cell signaling. In this video, we are going to focus mostly on the role of trimeric G proteins and the coupled receptor in the cell signaling pathway. So GPCR signaling can be broadly divided into three halves. So G alpha S signaling, G alpha Q signaling, and G alpha I signaling. So all these things are based on the alpha subunit composition of the trimeric G protein. One by one, we are going to talk about all of these. First, let's begin with G alpha signaling. So G alpha signaling starts with the membrane bound GPCR, which is a seven transmembrane domain receptor. It is always bound to trimeric G protein. When ligand binds, it activates the G protein coupled receptor. That leads to a small conformation change that help the trimeric G protein to get activated. Now the trimeric G protein generally is bound, the alpha subunit is bound to GDP. Upon ligand binding, it is bound to GTP. It can further activate adenylate cyclase. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that there are two configuration of these G alpha subunit, G alpha S subunit, GDP bound, which is a off state and GTP bound, which is a on state. And a switching between these two turns on and turns off the signaling. And who helps in this turning on or turning off? There are certain molecule known as GTPase activator protein, which eventually chops off a phosphate group from GTP and makes it GDP. So it, it is kind of like a switch off agent. And GIF or guanosine nucleotide exchange factor help in activation of these uh, uh, G protein. So this G alpha subunit, which is bound to GTP, can activate adenylate cyclase. This is a membrane bound enzyme that is capable of producing cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is a second messenger. We have a different video about several types of second messenger in a bit more details. If you want to learn about that, click on the I button and you would land on those videos. But anyway, ATP get converted into cyclic AMP molecule. Cyclic AMP is distinct from any other molecules inside the cell, making it a good candidate for becoming, becoming a second messenger. Now, only one cyclic AMP is not produced. Multiple rounds of uh, cyclic AMP production happens. Cyclic AMP eventually can bind to protein kinases known as PKA or protein kinase A. Now it has two kind of subunits, regulatory subunits which binds to cyclic AMP and catalytic subunits which dissociates upon cyclic AMP binding and can translocate into the nucleus. So this catalytic subunit eventually moves to the nucleus and uh, this gives rise to nuclear uh, kind of outcome. So it binds to the specific region in the DNA and it is, its binding is associated with CRIB and other proteins. Ultimately, it recruits 
transcription factors that allow transcription of several genes uh, involved in this GPCR pathway. One thing to note that GPCR pathway has that amazing capability of signal amplification. That means, let's say one ligand binds, it activates the GPCR. GPCR further activates several of these G protein molecules or G alpha subunits. Several G alpha subunit along with the adenylate cyclase is capable of generating multiple cyclic AMB molecules. So at each step, what we see is an amplification of the signal. So by the time it reaches the nucleus, the signal is al already augmented and amplified. So overall, it's important to note that adenylate cyclase can convert the cyclic uh, ATP to cyclic AMP in normal cases. Now sometimes what happens, this GPCR signaling goes wrong in disease condition. One example is Vibrio cholera infection or cholera. Cholera toxin can actually make the G alpha subunit to be constitutively active. That means active always. Uh, imagine the signaling never switched off. That leads to several, several rounds of cyclic AMP production. When cyclic AMP concentration is too high inside the cell, it actually lead to opening of several channels such as CFTR that allow chloride to diffuse out. And this chloride lead to an ionic disbalance which allows water to also move out. This creates the diarrhea in cholera. Now let's talk about G-alpha Q signaling. So again, we are talking about different types of G proteins couple receptor signaling and the main difference lies in the G alpha subunit. In this case, the subunit is G alpha Q subunit. G alpha sub uh, Q subunit is associated with GPCR, but G alpha Q subunit does not activate adenylate cyclase. Instead, it interacts with phospholipase C. So upon activation, this G alpha Q subunit activates phospholipase C. Phospholipase C can cleave off specific lipids in the plasma membrane and generate second messengers like IP3 and diacylglycerol or DAG. IP3 can eventually diffuse inside the cytoplasm and can bind to IP3 receptors present on the endoplasmic reticulum. That leads to calf calcium influx into the cytoplasm. So cytosolic calcium levels would go up and this cytosolic calcium change is kind of sensed by molecules like calmodulin. Now calmodulin bind to calmodulin kinase and this calmodulin kinase lead to, uh, lead to phosphorylation of several downstream targets. Many of these downstream targets are regulators of metabolic pathway. Some of them are uh, cell surface receptors. Some of them are transcription factors which upon phosphorylation might translocate into the nucleus and this is how the cellular effect of the GQ signaling is brought about. Also it's important to know that diacylglycerol is another second messenger. It can bind to protein kinase B which can further phosphorylate several downstream targets. Now let's talk about G alpha I signaling. Again the difference lies in the G alpha subunit. So G alpha I subunit has its own function. Instead of activating adenylate cyclase, it inactivates adenylate cyclase. This is the biological response. So the GABA receptor, which is a neurotransmitter receptor, are metabotropic receptors that mediate slow or prolonged inhibitory action in the nervous system. And these are actually G alpha I type of receptor. So GABA binds to the GABA receptor subunits activates specific ion channel and now in this case what happens so the G protein subunits dissociate the gamma and the beta subunit activates the GERC channel which allows potassium to move out of the cell and the G alpha I subunit actually inhibits adenylate cyclase. So when adenylate cyclase is inhibited voltage gated uh, sort of like ion channels gets also disrupted. 
so calcium influx is prevented so cation influx is prevented in the cell and the cation outflux is promoted that leads to its biological effect now g alpha s signaling is really important in biological and physiological context now we always see g alpha signaling regulation in glycogenolysis so it happens in muscles and in the liver imagine a scenario when you are chased by a mad dog who wants to bite you so obviously you have to run the hell out of there right so your muscle needs a hell of a lot of atp in a very short duration of time how it would generate the atp it would break down glucose after a point of time there would not be enough glucose so the muscle's glycogen would be broken down to glucose to fuel the muscle with energy so this glu glycogen to glucose conversion is actually regulated by your flight or fight hormone adrenaline so adrenaline is the ligand and the adrenaline receptor is the g protein coupled receptor which is bound with the g alpha s subunit so upon activation this g alpha s subunit activates cyclic amp cyclic amp as usual activates protein kinase a and it ultimately can phosphorylate downstream targets such as phosphorylase kinase so phosphorylase kinase further activates glycogen phosphorylase which breaks down the glycogen this is how the biological effect is brought about now glycogen breakdown supplies the uh, brain or or the entire muscle with enough amount of glucose so when we are starving our brain constantly need glucose so how we get that the reservoir of glycogen is in liver and the muscle so that gets broken down and brain gets it fuel right other than that there are several kind of specialized g protein coupled receptor paradigms for example um the g olfactory or g olf receptor so the olfactory receptors in the nose that helps us to recognize smells are actually g protein coupled receptors now in this case when a odor molecule bind to the g protein coupled receptor it leads to activation of adenylate cyclase which produces cyclic amp now this cyclic amp instead of activating protein kinase a it activates cert certain cyclic amp gated channels or cng channels that allows cation molecule to flux inside the neuron making the neuron more positive and allow the neuron to fire an action potential not only smell but also when we see things our vision is actually controlled by g protein coupled receptor signaling that's a different regime slightly different so if we zoom into our retina there are rods and cone cells now inside the rod cells there are rhodopsin these are actually g protein coupled receptors which are light activated so here the ligand is basically light the light actually converts 11 cis retinal into all trans retinal which leads to a conformational change and allows activation so these retinal is actually derived from beta carotene the source of vitamin a so basically all trans retinal help to activate the transducing g protein this transducin is actually bound to gdp and eventually it gets activated and it it is bound with gtp and this active transducin can actually activate an enzyme known as cyclic gmp phosphodiesterase whose job is to break down cyclic gmp so normally cyclic nucleotide gated channel allows sodium to be influxed into the cell at every time when the light is not there so the neurons of our eyes are always in a depolarized state in absence of light but when we see light there is a change in the cyclic gmp concentration it is broken down into gmp so the cyclic cng channels are now inactivated no more sodium influx inside so there would be a shutdown of the action potential so that means whenever there is a light whenever there is dark these neurons are always firing action potential in a depolarized state when there is light the they they are in a hypopolarized state and this is kind of like a binary signal that we recognize in our uh, vision process anyway it is important to note that again 
in our eyes this signal amplification process is happening one molecule of rhodopsin is estimated to activate 800 molecules of uh, transducin and eventually 4800 molecules of cyclic gmp can be broken down so at each step there would be signal amplification that actually allows us to amplify minute details lower light intensity inside our eye so it's pretty fascinating now other than that we need to look at the regulation of g protein signaling whenever we talk about any signaling pathway we need to understand how the pathway is regulated and how that pathway can be shut off because if any pathway or circuit is switched on for all the time it would lead to a detrimental biological consequence so obviously we looked at one mode of on one way by which the pathway can be shut off that means just switching between an active and inactive configuration of the g alpha subunit if it is gtp bound it is switched on if it is gdp bound it is switched off and we see how cholera toxin how diphtheria toxin can alter these activation states but other than that there are regulators of g g alpha subunit which actually prevents the rephosphorylation now there are specific kinases which phosphorylates the receptor and that phosphorylated receptor binds to a molecule called beta arestin which eventually binds to molecules like ap2 and lead to clathrin mediated endocytosis so obviously if the signaling receptor is taken inside the cell there is not much uh, receptor present on the surface to initiate new signal that's how a signaling response can be shut off and that is a predominant way by which one can uh, shut off a g protein coupled receptor signaling these receptors eventually get directed to the endosome sometimes it gets recycled back sometimes it can also get degraded now there are also cavioli mediated endocytosis that can internalize the g protein coupled receptors so i hope that gives us a, a bigger picture that how g protein coupled receptor can get uh, regulated so i hope this was useful if you like this video give it a quick thumbs up don't forget to like share and subscribe don't forget to check out all other videos in this same playlist and in this same course it would be super beneficial for you see you in next video